now, Ian Jessup on CFAX 1070. Welcome back. For the last several decades, right-wing governments around the world have argued that deregulation is our economic salvation. If only government would get out of the way, business would thrive, and we would all prosper. When the Gordon Campbell Liberals were elected in 2001, a Minister of State for Deregulation was established. Today in Ottawa, there's an Office of Deregulation. Has it helped or hindered us? Joining us to talk about deregulation is our regular guest, Damien Gillis. He's a documentary filmmaker and co-founder and publisher of the website, The Common Sense Canadian. Damien, thanks for joining us. Oh, a pleasure. Damien, what are your thoughts on deregulation, cutting red tape, streamlining regulations to make it easier for business to do business? Well, you've hit on some of the key euphemisms that are used uh, to, to sell this sort of regulatory or deregulatory agenda over the last number of years, both in B.C., at the federal level, in Canada. And I do think that these are dangerous words that obscure the, the real meaning on the ground uh, of, of these policies. And uh, we see it both in terms of environmental devastation, such as the recent Mount Pauly incident. We've seen it with pipeline incidents for n- a number of years, both in Canada and the United States. But we also see it undermining the stated purpose of of these policies, which is to foster economic development. And Christy Clark said in a speech in 2012 to the Association of Mineral Exploitation of BC, we need to get out of the way in order to liberate economic activity. And that that agenda unfolded. We've seen it over the last couple of years since she's been in power, and it's just a continuation of what we've seen with Gordon Campbell and, and the Harper uh, government as well. And what, what ends up happening uh, is you have problems like Mount Pauly here, where shareholders get hit with a 40-50% decline in their value, where workers get laid off, uh, where First Nations start to use exert their legal power to to intervene, even where in cases where permits have been handed out, we've seen this happen at Fish Lake with the uh, Tesico Mines uh, proposal, Prosperity Mine. We've seen it happening right now with Imperial Mines, the same company that owns Mount Pauly, with their mine that's in development, Redcrest, right now. And there's a controversy around permits they haven't solidified for their tailings pond. First Nations are now blockading that project. So I think the the evidence is that if you cut corners, you know, in order to, to further an ec- economic development uh, on the front end, you run the real risk of paying serious consequences, both environmental and economic, down the road. Do you sense that the the public is starting to shy away from this this term uh, deregulation and cutting red tape, and are, are are has the table turned and they're seeking uh, more government regulation in order to protect their own interests? Well, this may very well prove a watershed moment here, uh, Mount Pauly. This situation, I think, has really woken people up. It's been so visceral and visual with the aerial images and the ongoing health concerns. And and we've seen this sort of unfolding right before our eyes in a, in a very uh, poignant fashion. Uh, it may be the straw that breaks the camel's back here in British Columbia. Uh, I think it, I'm surprised to some extent that there hasn't been more of a wake-up call, and I hearken back to, or more of a change already, I harken back to the uh, economic meltdown. And in the follow-up to that, the aftermath, Alan Greenspan, the longtime chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States, who has presided over an unprecedented era of um, uh, financial market deregulation, admitted to a Senate committee there that we were wrong. What we had the, the model failed, the, the sort of Ayn Rand, uh, Milton Friedman, neoliberal privatization deregulation model uh, he admitted right there the the pope of high finance that, that this model was broken and it wasn't working and you would have thought that at that moment that a light bulb would have gone off and that regulators would have started to change their tune but you know, four or five years later uh, we still hear the same refrain in a lot of ways and there hasn't been a lot of admission here from uh, ministry officials uh, like uh, the minister bennett uh, and the premier, there hasn't been a real sense of guilt or culpability here on their part. I have I've seen them really doing their best to continue deflecting concerns. And even in this independent review that was announced this week, uh, you know, the one of the things they they may 
look at, examine regulatory oversight by the ministry as one of the areas of concern. It's not even something that's being mandated at this point. So it's it's slower to change than, than one might think. And it'll be very interesting to see where it goes from here. Damien, you, you referred to guilt and culpability. One of the things that I found very strange from uh, Energy Minister Bill Bennett uh, when this incident first happened on August 4th was that for the several days afterwards, it um, it his comments with me left the impression that the government was defending the company mm. instead of talking about defending and protecting the public interest and the environment. Did you have that feeling as well? Certainly, uh, you know there was a little bit of effort to to, to talk tough. There was a million dollar fine handed out to, long before any investigation had been carried out. So it's kind of uh, interesting that that he had enough information at that point to levy a fine, but not a very big one. And uh, and largely, I think that there has been a very defensive posture. I've heard the same comments that that you've had on your show from the minister, and I think we 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 have to examine the relationship between between this company and its key investors in the Liberal Party. We have to look at the fact that uh, there's half a million dollars of donations plus a big black tie dinner in Calgary that were hosted by uh, Calgary Flames and Mount Pauly um, major owner uh, Murray Edwards um, through his various companies half a million dollars of donations to the Liberal campaign in this last election. and. You know, is there a connection? We need to ask these these questions. Is there a connection? Are they receiving special treatment? Are they being treated with kid gloves here in view of the, the tremendous support that they gave this government to help them get elected? And is there a conflict of interest there? Uh, I think these are reasonable questions to ask when you consider just how defensive the government has been of its own record and of the company, as you point out. Let's go to the phone lines and uh, bring in Jack. Jack, you're on CFAX. Go ahead. Hi, um, I, I think your guest is kind of treating the issue almost with kid gloves. Uh, to me, I mean, our governments left us behind a long time ago. They don't work for us. They don't care about us. There is no democracy left. The, go- the, the government works directly for the corporations. And as a member of the NDP, I'll say that about the NDP, too. I mean, the opposition doesn't seem to work for us either. That's the fundamental problem we face, is that the government is no longer democratic, and we've got to take our democracy back. Do you have any comment, uh, Damien? I, I won't disagree with that, and I think you raise an important point. There, the, both parties received, in fact, the NDP for the first time in recent memory perhaps ever received more campaign, had a bigger campaign budget than the Liberals this time around, and they both, it's clear that the mining and oil and gas industries played both sides of this election, which is probably an intelligent uh, move on their part. Uh, it looked like the NDP had a chance of winning, and uh, and so they received a lot of money from industry too, and I, that may be connected to the lack of, uh, of, of strong criticism. I, I've certainly uh, you know, my colleague Rafe Mayer and, and myself, through our publication, a number of our uh, contributors were, were very tough on the NDP during the last election and questioning this sort of nice guy attitude that, uh, that Mr. Dix brought and why they weren't being tougher on a lot of these things. And we talk about private power projects that have driven people's bills through the roof. Uh, and we've seen a major environmental regulatory uh, lapse there. We, we look at uh, the policies around pipelines. We look at uh, the mining issues here that would that have now come to the fore even more since the election. So I, I won't disagree with your listener. I think we have a fundamental problem in our democracy. Uh, this incident has the potential of, of, of spurring enough popular uh, upset about this that it, it, that it could drive change. But in this democratic uh, first-past-the-post parliamentary system that we have, there is very little to force them to make changes. And, you know, I've been talking with Rafe about this recently because he was a SOCRED environment minister uh, years ago, mm-hmm. and he did deal with mines and other issues. And it, at that time, under, under Bill Bennett's government, the, the other Bill Bennett, um, if a minister presided over something of this nature, and they didn't have disasters even, I don't, there, this is the biggest tailing pond spill of its nature ever in, in, in the world. So we don't even really have anything to reference this to. But if anything remotely approaching this kind of disaster had occurred on on Bennett's watch, uh, it, the expectation was a minister would fall on their sword, that they would resign in disgrace. And we're not seeing anything remotely approaching that today. And I, I think we all have a role to play in this. I, I, without 
a popular uprising here from the public or demanding changes to this whole gutting of our regulatory regime, both provincially and federally, or we're not going to see the changes that we need uh, to address these problems in the future. We've got lots of other mines on the horizon, and, and a number of which have recently been permitted to go ahead, and they face many of the same sorts of problems that, that we've seen with Mount Pauly on the horizon. Uh, so now is a now is the time to to get upset about this and ensure that it translates into real action politically. But it's not going to be easy given the system that we have. Jack, you want to have a last comment before we go to commercial break? Yeah, I would just say that the deregulation is the symptom. The root problem is the fact that you know democracy means the people rule. That's the literal translation of the Greek words. And in this province and in this country, the people are completely irrelevant. They absolutely don't care what we want, and that's what we have to get back. Jack, I read a piece on the air the other day, and it was titled, Government is not our friend, it's our employee. And I think we have to realize that we are the government, and those people work for us. That's right. Yep. Thank you very much. You. We're talking to uh, Damien Gillis. He's documentary filmmaker, co-publisher, and uh, founder of the website The Common Sense Canadian. We'll take a commercial break and come back. Join the CFAX Conversation on Facebook. Ian Jessup on CFAX 1070. <laughs> Interactive Talk, Ian Jessup on CFAX 1070. Welcome back. Damien Gillis is our guest. He is with the website The Common Sense Canadian, and we're talking about uh, deregulation, cutting red tape, and streamlining. And Damien, even the Americans are now suspicious of our lack of environmental controls, and you posted on your website, The Common Sense Canadian, a letter from Alaskan Senator Lisa Murkowski to Secretary of State John Kerry, and I read that on the air the other day. She's expressing concern that large-scale mining in B.C. has the potential to affect fisheries and communities in southeast Alaska because of our lack of environmental controls. What does that tell us about what we're doing? Well, it should it should be uh, embarrassing for us to, to know that our neighbors don't trust our regulatory processes anymore, and I think it's with good reason. And there are three major mines that she's uh, addressing here that are in this sort of transboundary region where they're on the V.C. side of the border, but they're close enough to Alaska that uh, an environmental disaster would spill over uh, over the border. And uh, they have largely, the one mine in particular is called the KSM, Kerr Sulfites, Mitchell mine, three different mountains all next to each other. And this would be one of the largest gold copper mines in the world, and it would carry a tailing spawn six times the size of Mount Pauly. Six times? Right, yes, yeah, sitting right on the NASA. It would be one of the biggest tailing ponds in the world, two billion tons of tailings it would hold. And it sits right on the Nass River, which is uh, our third biggest salmon river in British Columbia. And so they largely, uh, due to a lack of state resources, uh, through the provincial review, our provincial review of this mine over the last year, and they have largely, they haven't engaged a whole lot, and they've put a lot of faith, I think, obviously misguided in the RBC process, and there's a number of statements that have been made by their state regulators to that effect. And local conservation groups up there were raising red flags about this for a long time, knowing how this province operates and how they have been actively streamlining, and they've used that kind of language. And in that region in particular, northwest BC, there are a number of projects on the table, and they have been pushed forward, and it's resulted in conflict with First Nations, who said they haven't had enough time to be properly consulted and to engage with the process in a meaningful way. There's lots of concerns about fish and that this uh, KSM mine. And so now they're starting to backtrack here and realize that uh, maybe they weren't so, so wise to trust B.C. with this process. It's currently before the federal government right now. They're doing their federal review, and there's still a few days left. I think it's on the uh, the 20th. Uh, where people can submit comments, and it would be a good thing for British Columbians to do who, f- who feel like the provincial process wasn't wasn't strong enough uh, to write to the federal government. And, and uh, there is an opportunity. We have seen this happen once. Even even the Harper government, which is known for having gutted our Fisheries Act and Navigable Waters Protection Act and slashed environmental staff monitoring, etc., uh, they're certainly no, no slouch when it comes to deregulation. 
but we've we've had projects, for instance, the Fish Lake uh, Prosperity Mine project by uh, Tesico that was twice approved by the provincial government and rejected by the federal government. So the Harper government looked at it, took a second look, and said, "No, no, this is no good. There's fish concerns. The First Nations are concerned," and, and so even compared to the Harper government, in some cases, you could say that B.C. is more more in the wild, wild west when it comes to mines. So this is going to start causing problems for us when, when even when B.C. has issued permits, they can get opened up again, and these companies are investing in that process. Shareholders are being led down the garden path, to some extent told that everything's going to be okay, and then they can end up having the rug pulled out from underneath of them later on if, they, if the, this process hasn't been rigorous enough. And I think we're going we're gonna to hear a lot more of that going forward and we just spent 400 uh, pardon me 746 million dollars on the northwest transmission line in order yeah. to open up some of these uh, uh, mining proposals that's right and that's on taxpayers yep. particularly BC taxpayers and that project is we discussed uh, in an earlier conversation about a month ago we're talking yep. about the fiscal boondoggles under this government uh, uh, not keeping track of the spending when it comes to some of these big projects and that's an example where that project is something like a hundred and eighty percent of its original budget and all of that cost overrun is on the shoulders of BC taxpayers and BC hydro ratepayers and and so we We've sunk a lot of money into that project. It's gone wildly over budget, and it's all on the promise of opening up mines and creating jobs for British Columbians, which are all in jeopardy now, I would argue, in the wake of this Mount Pauly situation. Red Chris mine in particular, because uh, and, and there's a real direct connection here. Imperial Metals, we can see one of the things they were able to do, even knowing that they were over capacity with this pond, that they'd had four warnings from, from the ministry, toothless warnings, I, I would add, that weren't followed up on and enforced about issues with their tailing pond. And what did they do at that very time? They pumped even more effluent into it because they needed to ramp up production. And that mine, Mount Pauly, was serving as the cash cow to provide the capital to build their new mine, Red Chris. And so all of that now is up in the air with with these cleanup costs, with the share stock hit that they've taken, uh, and and now First Nations uh, protesting this. So if I was an Imperial Metal shareholder, I, I would I'd be very concerned about the way the company has conducted itself and the way the government has allowed it to to conduct itself. Damien, on Monday I was talking to uh, a couple of folks uh, in uh, the Clayquot Sound area of northern Vancouver Island, which uh, yeah. they were interested. Uh, they're trying to. Uh, uh, stop mining development in the area and Imperial Metals has a couple same company, of, same company. and yeah. uh, the government has always talked about jobs and how mining mm-hmm. will create uh, a, a tremendous amount of jobs in British Columbia and, and one of the fellows with the Friends of Clayquot said in British Columbia there are 127,000 people employed in the tourism industry and only 4,000 in the mining industry mm-hmm. so there aren't a heck of a lot of jobs in mining granted they pay extremely well but there aren't that many jobs, are there? No, in fact, yeah, I would actually, I have numbers that are even higher, like 185,000 in tourism. I think that in the gross sector, it's worth $13.5 billion to this province. Uh, we took in a grand total of $150 million of royalties from the oil and gas industry last year. Uh, it's a different sector, but, but uh, you know, another mm-hmm. major resource sector where we're actually really not seeing a lot of fiscal benefit or and there certainly are some jobs but the other movement that we're having here i find it extraordinarily disingenuous the way the government is presenting and pushing the, the, these for these are uh, projects forward on the argument of jobs when at the same time behind their back they're signing deals with ch- the chinese government to in, to ensure the steady flow of cheaper uh, labor from china to uh, to replace uh, more expensive canadian laborers uh, around the LNG industry, and the same thing has happened. This is enabled by federal changes to our immigration laws, which have allowed uh, any company in the resource sector to import a foreign temporary worker from another country, pay him 15% less than the equivalent Canadian laborer. So we have we, we are making systemic changes here to ensure that many of these jobs will not even go to British Columbians. And we have an example of a coal mine owned by a Chinese company, HD Minerals, in the Tumbler Ridge, Chetwind area, that has imported 400 or so workers from China, didn't even give BC 
uh, miners an opportunity to compete for those jobs. And they, their union took it to court and uh, ultimately lost. And so as we speak, those uh, that mine is being filled by laborers from out of the country. So the, this argument really doesn't hold water when you, when you look at the way that uh, both levels of government are working uh, on, on the foreign worker side of the equation. And just in general, we're putting tremendously valuable tourism economy at risk uh, by these mines. Cat Face Mine that Imperial Metals would be building involves blowing the top off of uh, Cat Face Mountain, which is the most visible landmark in Clackwood Sound. You can't go anywhere on your sea kayak or uh, boat or anything without seeing this thing. And it would absolutely, I, I don't see how you can have both, to have the, the level of tourism coming to Tofino every year and have a giant mine right in the middle of Clackwood Sound like that by a company like Imperial Metals, and we know how they operate. So we, we do have to start making some choices here, and we should be doing that based on solid information, not this sort of dogmatic promises that are being made that aren't being followed up on. Damien, always great to talk to you. Uh, we'll have a chat again in a few weeks. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. It's Damien Gillis, documentary filmmaker and co-founder and publisher of the website The Common Sense Canadian.